Peripheral arterial disease, aortic disease, and heart disease in pregnancy is a short, tight section that's really based on, give us the questions that you will find on these diseases. I also want you to notice that we specifically use the term peripheral arterial disease, not peripheral vascular disease, because peripheral vascular disease could imply the veins. Our concern here is exclusively arterial insufficiency. Peripheral arterial diseases, stenosis of the peripheral arteries from diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, tobacco smoking. It is the same features as cause coronary disease. The major exception is no family history as it is in coronary disease. You don't have a family history of peripheral disease and do not confuse this with thromboangiitis obliterans or Berger's disease that comes from a hypersensitivity reaction to tobacco smoking. This is vascular atherosclerotic fibrofatty plaques on the inside of your peripheral arteries. Now, since it's fibrofatty plaques, that's why it doesn't get better with calcium channel blockers. It's not vasospastic. Vasospastic disease, like Raynaud's disease, gets better with calcium channel blockers. The most common of the risk factors is hypertension. The worst of the risk factors is diabetes, the same as it is for coronary disease. How do I answer what's the most likely diagnosis? Well, this is angina of your calves. That's what claudication is. It's pain there, relieved by rest, walking up or down hills. That's how you tell it apart from spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis is more pain when walking down hills, downstairs. Spinal stenosis is no pain when leaning forward, but peripheral arterial disease is up or down, and it also is associated with a smooth skin. Why? Because the vascular insufficiency makes you lose hair follicles, makes you lose sweat glands, makes you lose those sebaceous glands. The skin becomes shiny and smooth. And before you start saying, my goodness, maybe I should get this because I won't have to shave my legs. Well, yes, that's true, but you also start to lose your toes too and that's not ideal it's better to keep shaving and keep your toes remember in answering what is the most likely diagnosis spinal stenosis is very 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 exquisitely positional of which direction you're walking when you get the pain peripheral arterial disease is any direction as long as you're exerting yourself The diagnostic test for peripheral arterial disease is unquestionably the ankle brachial index. Which is normally greater, the blood pressure in your ankles or in your arms? Well, when you're lying flat, they're equal. And when you're standing up, the blood pressure is definitely supposed to be greater in your ankles. So if you have an ankle brachial index where it looks like the blood pressure in your ankles and your lower extremities, is more than 10% less than in your arms. Well, this is very significant disease. They should be exactly the same. Or when you are standing, the blood pressure in your ankles should be greater. It's a very common mistake for medical students because they figure, well, I'm always measuring the blood pressure in my arms, so, and it's closer to the heart, so it must be greater in my arms. But you keep forgetting that gravity, gravity, Gravity means that just by standing up, the blood pressure is 30 or 40 percent greater in your ankles than a normal person. The same way they pump the water to the water tower in the top of the building, and you flush the toilet and it comes down just by gravity. Just gravity. The most accurate test is an angiogram. But you don't have to do an angiogram unless you're going to do revascularization, unless you're going to bypass it or angioplasty it. There is no routine screening for peripheral arterial disease because asymptomatic peripheral arterial disease is irrelevant. You're not going to die from it. You don't have sudden calf death and die. You only do the test if you're going to treat it. And there's no point in treating it if it's asymptomatic because you don't have a sudden overwhelming arrhythmia from your calves. The treatment for peripheral arterial disease has changed a little bit. Because in addition to aspirin, of course, stopping smoking is solostazole. That's new, not this year or last year, but it's not eternal, solostazole. Solostazole is the single most effective medication. It's antispasmodic, 
an antiplatelet, antispasmodic antiplatelet. Surgery and angioplasty if medical therapy is not effective. And you, how do I know if it's not effective? Because it hurts. It hurts. Now, the major vascular risk factors and predisposers have to be controlled. Blood pressure has to be controlled, but the cutoff is 140 over 90. It's 140 over 90. It's not lower. Very important question. A man comes with a history of peripheral arterial disease. His blood pressure is 136 over 86. What do you do about the blood pressure? You leave it alone. It's okay. But the LDL has to be brought under 100 because bottom line, if, if you didn't have a history of coronary disease, but you had peripheral arterial disease, you have coronary disease. You just don't know it. You just don't know it. That's not an isolated system. So diabetes also has to be controlled, and the lower you bring that hemoglobin A1C, under 7 is the target, under 7%, under 7%, the more controlled your disease will be, and it won't progress. A 67-year-old man's in the emergency department, a sudden onset of chest pain. It's felt between his scapula, and he has a history of high blood pressure, tobacco smoking. Well, these are both important risk factors for vascular disease and aortic disease. But what is the best initial test? What's the first thing to do to see if this man is dissecting? The first thing to do if somebody's dissecting is to see if he's got a widened mediastinum on the chest x-ray. Now, chest x-ray may not be as specific as an MRA or TEE or CT angiogram. But it is the first thing to do. Chest CT doesn't show very much that specific. Neither does transthoracic echo. Simply not good enough. Not accurate enough. They're just not accurate enough. MRA is good. It has about equal sensitivity and specificity to transesophageal echo. Equal sensitivity is to CT angiogram. MRA, TE, and CT angiogram are same accuracy. But they're not the first thing to do. Chest x-rays first for wide mediastinum. The single most accurate, more accurate than all the others, is angiography. But the question doesn't say what's the most accurate. It says, what would you do first? And here it is. This is the wide mediastinum. It's the wide mediastinum. And line one is a wide mediastinum. And basically, this is what will tell you it's time to do the MRA, CTE, or the T -E -E. Now, what we tend to use is CT angiograms simply because you don't have any complications beyond the contrast. TEE requires a rather extensive amount of expertise. You have to be able to get a catheter in there and go down the throat and take a look. But CT angiogram can be 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The most frequently tested points in aortic disease is unquestionably the diagnostic tests for acute dissection. What we just said, x-ray first, TEE, CT angiogram, MRA, and screening recommendations for abdominal aortic aneurysm. And that's relatively new in the last couple of years. Highly tested because screening is everybody's business. The key point for that dissection, how do I recognize it? There's pain in between the scapula, and although there is a blood pressure difference between the arms, please don't wait for that to happen. Don't wait for that to happen, because it means that somebody's about to die. It's like waiting for crepitus with a skin infection. It means you're about to die. The best initial therapies control that blood pressure because when you control that blood pressure, you stop the rip, rip, rip. And that's why we use beta blockers first and then nitroprusside. And that's not a random order because if you're actually asked to choose between beta blockers and nitroprusside first, the first thing is the beta blockers. Stop that shearing ripping forces that worsen that dissection. Beta blockers are started first also to prevent the reflex tachycardia and nitroprusside then you can go to the operating room. Which of the following is the most appropriate screening for aortic aneurysm? And by this, we mean abdominal aortic aneurysms because there is no screening for thoracics, but abdominal aortic aneurysms, which one? And the answer is 
men who are ever smokers. Now, that's important because the question can easily say, hey, a man gave up smoking seven years ago. And if this was lung cancer, the risk of lung cancer goes almost to zero after seven years. Seven years, the cutoff for when they stop having a major risk of lung cancer. But if you stopped smoking 25 years ago, you should be screened on your 65th birthday. It means 65 year old man and his 65 year old wife have an anniversary together and they say, honey, where do you wanna go? And they said, how about we go to the doctor and I'll get an abdominal aortic aneurysm screening and you can get bone densitometry. We'll hold hands while I get my sonogram and you get your DEXA scan. Isn't that romantic? Now we're not gonna to have to do it for everybody and CT angiogram has complications. It has contrast to CT angiogram. And everyone over 50 is simply not accurate because there aren't that many and also smoking is the big risk. That's why just having the general population at any age is incorrect. It's an ever smoker above the age of 65. That's why. And women simply don't have as many aneurysms and that's why the recommendation is not in women. Which of the following is most dangerous to a pregnant woman? And the answer is peripartum cardiomyopathy. Now, peripartum cardiomyopathy, if you get pregnant again and you have peripartum cardiomyopathy with persistent LV dysfunction, you have a 50 to 70% chance of death. That's why when people say that they're opposed to abortion, even when the life of the mother is at risk, they simply don't understand what they're talking about because two-thirds to three-quarters of women will simply die if they get pregnant again. And death of the mother is teratogenic, you know what I mean? Baby can't do well if mom is dead. And that's because if you're still walking out those antibodies, it becomes like cardiac anaphylaxis. You get pregnant again, you make those antibodies, and your heart will fail instantly over a few days or weeks. Eisenmengers would be the next in the order of dangerous things because that's pulmonary hypertension. It's such severe pulmonary hypertension, you have right to left shunt. Now, for, for this question, this is one of those questions that the average medical student would not know. But you are not here to be average. You are not here to pass. You are here to kick ass. Consequently, peripartum cardiomyopathy is the worst. Eisenmengers is the second worst. After that, mitral stenosis. But mitral stenosis is not as dangerous simply because we can fix it. You cannot fix peripartum cardiomyopathy. You have to transplant. You have to transplant. Mitral stenosis you can fix in 20 minutes in a cath lab. That's why it's not the most dangerous. It's eminently fixable. Mitral valve prolapse actually gets better because the bigger the heart, the better it gets. And atrial septal defect depends if there's flow going in the wrong direction. If there's no major flow, it's just simply not as dangerous as the other choices. The order of dangerous things, number one, peripartum cardiomyopathy with persistent LV dysfunction. Number two, Eisenmengers, which is severe pulmonary hypertension. And remember, if there's severe pulmonary hypertension, which is more dangerous to a person, right to left shunt or left to right? Which is more dangerous? Why right to left? Because it's deoxygenated blood. Now the pregnant woman has a 50% increase in plasma volume. Well, it's not going to get oxygenated. It's going to go straight from right to left without being oxygenated. The woman's going to become an anaerobe. No good. It is unknown why the antibodies are made against the heart in a pregnant woman. It happens, we don't know why. Most people get better. The LV dysfunction is reversible in the short term. Now, if the LV dysfunction doesn't improve, she's gotta go get transplanted. There's no way to predict who's gonna improve. You simply do echocardiograms and see what the symptoms are. And don't get pregnant again. The therapy of dilated cardiomyopathy of Peripartum cardiomyopathy is the same as it would be if it was anybody else, ACE or ARBs, beta blockers, spironolactone, diuretics, digoxin, and don't worry about teragenicity. Number one, the baby is out. Number two, the life of the mother is more important than the teragenicity. Number three, 
It happens after delivery so the kid can drink formula from a bottle. I'm sure the baby would rather have an alive mother than worrying about having to breastfeed. So don't breastfeed. Take the ACE inhibitor. Remember that the reason that Eisenmenger's is so dangerous is it's the right to left shunting. It's anaerobic metabolism. The blood gets shunted without being oxygenated, and that's why it is so dangerous, because the plasma volume goes up, and it is a severe pulmonary hypertension, making the left to right shunt reverse into a right to left shunt. That's what the word Eisenmenger's phenomena or Eisenmenger's syndrome is. It's left to right shunting reversing into right to left shunting, and therefore it's very severe, and that's why it's so dangerous to a pregnant lady. If peripartum cardiomyopathy is not one of the choices, and the question says, what is the worst cardiac lesion in a pregnant lady? Then look for Eisenmenger's in the choices. Remember that pregnancy increases that plasma volume, and although mitral stenosis gets much worse in pregnancy, it's simply not as bad as the peripartum and the Eisenmengers. Because this is the stepwise progression of Eisenmengers. A large left to right shunt in a congenital heart defect leads to pulmonary hypertension. And the pulmonary hypertension, when it gets very severe, reverses the shunt and leads to right to left shunting. 